Hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, as mentioned, I will be discussing a content masking attack against inf uh, information-based online services. This is a work by Dr. Min Shen and myself as co-first authors, as well as Dr. Yao Liu and Dr. Zhou Lu, all from the University of South Florida. First talk about our motivation. The Adobe PDF standard is the standard for consistent cross-computer document rendering. When you open up a uh, PDF on any computer, it should look about the same. Uh, these PDF documents can't be edited with commonly accessible tools. So Microsoft Word, Adobe Reader, they're, um, they, they can't open PDFs in a way that they can edit them. Rather, you use Microsoft Word or Latex or something to uh, write content and then render that into a PDF document. So this confers a sense of integrity of the document. It's an export. It's a final product. But there's a disconnect between what's in a PDF and what's actually displayed. The computer and the human see two different things. So there's underlying text, and then font files are applied to that underlying text to make rendered text. And within that disconnect, we perform our content masking attack. So we can compromise the content integrity of PDF files. So three uh, important systems rely on the integrity of these documents, uh, including automatic reviewer assignment systems for academic papers, as well as plagiarism detection systems, and document indexing services, such as search engines. Some background information about these services. They support PDF submission. And rather than looking at the rendered content of those PDFs, they look at the underlying text. So they scrape that text out um, and ignore the fonts associated with it. So for conference reviewer assignment systems, they use topic matching algorithms to assign reviewers to submitted papers which basically looks at frequent words appearing in the submitted paper uh, and compares those frequent words with frequent words that appear within the reviewer's uh, published papers. And whichever reviewer has papers published that have similar content, similar frequent words to the subject paper is assigned that paper. So for example, Infocom. Uh, uses latent semantic indexing, the LSI topic mat matching algorithm. Uh, I don't single them out at all. Uh, this is just um, they, they uh, published their uh, automatic conference reviewer assignment system uh, so that we can all be uh, impressed and understand how it works. Plagiarism detection systems uh, measure the similarity between strings inside a subject document and within the database of all the other documents that have ever been submitted. And finally, document indexing services such as search engines return uh, uh, documents based on the similarity of their content to the search string. So our attack works, again, within that disconnect between the underlying text and the rendered text. And so you can think of it like in an encoding mechanism, where the font applies a cipher to the plain text to make a cipher text that is actually rendered. And so our attack changes the plain text while leaving that cipher text able to be understood by human readers. And we accomplish that by changing the font files. We alter the relationship between the letters and their glyphs inside those font files such that the content displayed is different from the underlying content. So a masking font in this context is a custom font with some rearrangement of the relationship between letters and their glyphs. So open source tools such as FontForge let you copy and paste a character glyph from one letter to another letter. And custom fonts may be imported into LaTeX or Word or whatever other tool um, you use to generate your PDF. So that's a fairly simple uh, attack. So our application to conference reviewer assignment systems, um, now I'm sure none of you would do this, but you could target a specific reviewer. Maybe you know that that reviewer is easier on papers than other reviewers, or 
maybe you know them personally and want to trade favors with them. I'm sure that wouldn't happen, but you can target a specific reviewer by replacing enough keywords in your paper with keywords in the papers that they have published. And so those keywords are uncommon words that appear most frequently. So not including words like the or and, but maybe power grids or authentication. And so our algorithm, we take the keywords in the subject paper and in the target reviewer's papers and order them by frequency descending. So we have a list of the important words within the subject paper and a list of important words in the target reviewer's papers. And we make a word mapping between these lists. The most frequent word is mapped to the most frequent word, etc. And then we create a character mapping between each of those word mappings, the first letter to the first letter, and so on down the line. And then we replace the underlying text with the uh, masked text and have that render back as the understandable human text. So there's a couple challenges with this. Uh, the one-to-many character mapping challenge is, uh, for example, the if you were going to use the underlying text green and map that to the word brown, then you need an E to map to an O and you need an E to map to a W. Uh, so we use multiple fonts for this purpose. And then the word length disparity challenge. Words are of different lengths. So if you're trying to render a small word as a large word or a large word as a small word, there's a couple different approaches which are shown in the figure. Uh, we call the first one a favorable mapping because it's easier to take care of, and that is to take a large word and map it to a small word. And basically, the extra letters of the large word are just mapped to a blank clearing font. This clearing font is not actually completely blank. It's just a uh, every letter is, uh, has an entry that is just a single dot that is one unit by one unit. Uh, for reference, uh, an I, the letter I, is about 500 units wide, so this is effectively uh, invisible. And then the unfavorable mapping, uh, mapping a small word to a large word, we just take the last letter of the small word and map that to the last few characters of the larger word. So our experiment for this uh, variant of our attack, we reproduced the Infocom uh, automatic reviewer assignment system, again because they published a paper detailing how it works. And we included 114 TPC members from a security conference and 2,000 of their papers to use to train this system. And then we used uh, 100 additional papers for testing data. So for matching a paper to one reviewer, uh, this is uh, one uh, specific paper. And you can see that the blue stars gradually rise to the top so that the similarity score between the subject paper and the target reviewer gradually increases as we mask more words, showing that we are effectively able to target a specific reviewer for our paper. Uh, so that was one paper. This is um, showing for all 100 papers the number of words that must be masked to effectively assign that paper to that reviewer. And as you can see, uh, two thirds of the time you need six words six unique words masked, um, and in every case, you need less than 15. Uh, now we're looking at the number of masking fonts that are required, uh, dealing with that uh, one-to-many character mapping challenge. Um, a naive solution to this attack might be to impose a limit on the number of fonts that you can embed within a paper. However, um, as you all have embedded fonts to uh, submit your papers to conferences, you, you notice that there's 12, 15, 20 fonts embedded in a paper, and uh, so a simple threshold will not defend against this attack. Finally, uh, we also experiment with targeting multiple reviewers. Usually you need three to accept your paper before your paper is accepted. And so the uh, blue stars, black circles, and green triangles you see uh, go up to the top of this uh, similarity score, indicating that we can target three specific reviewers to make our paper most similar to. This works slightly different than the normal case. Uh, instead of the most frequent word being mapped to the most frequent word, um, you have to split them over three different people. Now, uh, our variant of the attack against plagiarism detection. A cheating student could evade a plagiarism detector by replacing the underlying text with gibberish, which then maps back to human legible text that has been plagiarized. 
Uh, so if you completely scramble that underlying text, that results in zero similarity with previous work. But that's not very realistic. Uh, because of common phrases, or sometimes students will copy the, uh, the questions into the document, which uh, has been done enough times that that's considered plagiarism, but isn't actually. So zero similarity is unrealistic. So we look at a couple methods to target a specific similarity score. Near zero, but not zero. The first one is by letter. So we make scrambling fonts that scramble all but the n most frequently used characters in the language. And we vary n to see if we can target a specific similarity score. And then we do the same type of thing by word, uh, where we apply a scrambling font to all words except the n most frequently used words, and vary n to see if we can target a specific similarity score. And our third method is by word at random. So just apply the scrambling font with a certain probability. And this is the result of that experiment. Uh, we used 10 published papers and uh, changed the percentage of text uh, scrambled in those papers and then uploaded them to turn it in to see what their similarity score was. And as you can see, the uh, random word replacement is probably the best one. That's the solid blue line. Um, it has a nice slow scope, uh, and, uh, meaning that you can target that specific similarity score between 5 and 15 percent. Now against document indexing, an attacker can place spam or illicit content in PDFs indexed by search engines. Um, so your underlying content may be perfectly legitimate, but you render it to be something bad or annoying. And then a person searching for that legitimate underlying content will be greeted with that annoying content instead. This is kind of like a special case of the uh, first method we discussed, um, but instead of masking particular words, we're masking the entire document, but we're not constrained by spaces, so it's a little easier. Since we're masking the entire document, we'll need more masking fonts. So instead of generating them ad hoc, we just have the idea of having one font for each glyph. So there would be an A font that would map all characters to the letter A, and so on for all the, all the letters, numbers, punctuation. It's about 84 fonts. And that also allows for easy automated generation of masked documents. You just throw together a script that applies the font that you need for each letter iterating over the documents. And our experiment, we used five well-known published papers and then masked each as gibberish. So the underlying text under the uh, document that's shown is legible English text. Uh, we could render it as legible English text, but for the sake of this experiment, all we need to do is prove that search engines will index this according to the underlying content and not the displayed content. So we submitted them to leading search engines, including Bing, Yahoo, uh, DuckDuckGo, and Google. And the results were the same for each of the five test documents. And that was that the attack was successful for Bing, Yahoo, and DuckDuckGo. Yahoo marked it as spam, uh, but then a few days later unmarked it as spam. So that's cool. And uh, it was not successful against Google. Um, we speculate that they performed optical character recognition on the document and then saw it was gibberish and decided it was spam. Um, but if they did that, we would suggest that our uh, defense method they might actually use because it's a little more lightweight and very accurate. Here's just a couple screenshots of the results showing up under Bing and Yahoo. Uh, we searched for that underlying text and that is the PDF that we hosted, which uh, is rendered to gibberish. So for our defense method, as I just mentioned, you could perform optical character recognition over the whole document and check the integrity of each character. But there's a couple problems with that. You have high computational overhead. So an academic paper is 50 to 75,000 characters. Uh, and optical character re recognition requires uh, more time as you process more images, more size. 
there's also a high error rate um, because uh, characters are rendered small and close together. It can confuse the image processing techniques uh, used by OCR. So our solution is to render each character that are in the fonts embedded within the PDF file, render those in a separate image, and perform OCR on that image. So the idea there is to uh, pull out what the uh, character codes are uh, for the characters within the font and compare them with the underlying text and see that it is the same. So this saves some processing time because it, at most you could maybe have 2,000 characters um, of unique fonts within a PDF rather than 50 to 75,000. There's a couple challenges with this. Uh, for one, you can embed a whole font file, which is actually about the same number of characters as an academic paper, which wouldn't uh, improve anything. So we just scan the document to extract which characters are actually used and then perform OCR on those characters. The second challenge is special characters. Uh, you can use special characters legitimately for math or something but they also kind of look like regular characters in some cases. Uh, so if you perform OCR on this thing that looks like a P, and it looks like a P, then you're going to have two different character codes, and when you compare them, they'll be different, and that will be a false alarm. So our solution is to perform a font training step, where we, uh, before any of this, we, we use popular fonts, Times New Roman, etc., and perform OCR on the whole font, and build up a list of similar characters for each normal character. So for the letter A, we look and see how many special characters look like A, etc. So we have a list of similar character lists. So what happens in this case is that when we look at this special character, we see that it is in the list of special characters for the normal character P, and so we just switch it out for the letter P. This allows the end uh, applications to process the text in a meaningful way. Uh, for example, uh, an old attack against plagiarism detectors is to use a special character that looks like a normal character. In this case, we switch it out for the normal character and pass it on to the plagiarism detector. So it's able to then detect the plagiarism. So we do uh, three experiments to show the performance of our font verification method. Uh, first, we generate 10 PDF files uh, with masked characters varying from 5 to 20 percent uh, of appearance. And uh, detection rate here is the number of characters which are correctly identified as themselves. Uh, which indicates whether or not it will be possible to uh, understand if a uh, uh, content masking attack is happening or not. And you can see as the number of masked characters gets smaller, the detection rate for OCR decreases uh, quite a bit, uh, to zero in fact, uh, which is not particularly intuitive, but uh, basically uh, when you have fewer masked characters, they just kind of blend in and it's not able to discern them. Our second experiment analyzes the effects of document length on the detection rate for each method. So we generated 10 PDF files ranging from 1 to 10 pages in length, and all of them have an even 30% distribution of masked characters. And we find that as the number of pages increases, the detection rate for full document OCR decreases due to the probability of error that naturally arises. Uh, but our method stays right around 100%. Now there is actually a slight dip, if you can see it, around page four or five. Um, that's where there was a colon that got confused with a semicolon in our font verification step. Uh, that was our single error. And our final experiment, we analyzed the effects of document length on the detection time for each method. So we generated 20 PDF files ranging from one to 20 pages and again having a 30% distribution of masked characters. And as expected, the full document OCR method increases linearly with the amount that it has to process, whereas our method is fairly static. Um, in fact, if the same characters are used on every page, then our method will be perfectly constant. 
So in conclusion, we describe a new content masking attack against the Adobe PDF standard and show how it can subvert three important systems, uh, automatic reviewer assignment systems, plagiarism detection systems, and document indexing. And we create and evaluate a font verification algorithm that is more lightweight and accurate than OCR for this purpose. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Jeremy Epstein, National Science Foundation. Um, cool, cool uh, study. Um, and what I'm wondering about is uh, your approach is, is based on static PDFs, but PDFs can be dynamic also. There was a demo I saw a few years ago where um, you could have, it, it was in the context of voting. Um, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it looked like you voted for Smith, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays, it looked like you voted for Jones, depending on just opening the same PDF. And so what I'm wondering is, if you have dynamic sort of uh, things like that, how could somebody use that against you, or can, can you detect those sorts of things that look different depending on the day of the week or the time of day or whatever, phase of the moon? Well, if it's going to be displaying text, then that's going to be displaying text that is uh, in a font file that's embedded within the PDF. So we will be able to check that font file and verify that all the characters are as they are supposed to be. Uh, so we'll be able to do our font verification um, and then whatever content is displayed will be uh, good or bad according to our font verification. Okay, but um, I could set it up so that um, there's a lot of text that doesn't normally uh, show up um, uh, and the stuff that shows up on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays is the plagiarized text. It, uh, if if mm -hmm. reviewers know to look on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, then they would see the plagiarized. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm sort of thinking this on the fly, but it seems sure. that you might be able to manipulate things so that it's what's in there isn't what you see. Sure. Um, depending on the, the code that is used in there to change uh, how that is, we could certainly potentially follow that code and see that there's different characters being rendered on different times, um, and then choose those characters out of the embedded font files to verify. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Sanji Kaligi, University of Washington. Um, so I, I don't know if you already mentioned something about this, but uh, there, so there are PDFs where instead of rendering font, they they render an image, and then the text is rendered in white behind the image, or something to that effect, so that it's like, if you had a, a PDF and you had OCR'd it already, mm -hmm. then it has the text, but the PDF itself is still an image. So is there any reason why uh, you would want to do the uh, the font manipulation as opposed to something like that? Like, does the font manipulation gain you something over just rendering text as an image on top? Okay, so there's a couple things there. Um, hidden text. Uh, our font verification would be able to see that there's his hidden text um, because that, that text is present within the strings that are in the PDF. So we would check that text and, and pass that on to the end system. So for a search engine, they would then see that underlying text even if it's not rendered for a human to see. Um, and images, if it's an image, then you perform OCR on it at that point because it's an image. Uh, there's no underlying text in that case. OK. All right, thank you. One thing I was wondering is, do you have any sense for whether these attacks are being used in the wild or how much they're being used in the wild? It seems like you could potentially use your defense as a measurement tool to scrape for PDFs and then see if, if anything is flagged. Um, well, I would certainly uh, hope that it's not being done in the case of academic conferences. Um, in the case of search engines, um, the fact that Google does perform OCR on theirs and did stop our attack without presumably knowing that it is an, a thing um, yet, 
indicates that there's some interest in verifying that integrity. So. Cool. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Ian again.